Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to uh, introduce the guest tonight. Um, Dave Sperry and I have been serving as fellows of the Wheatley Institution for the last couple of years, and it has been an honor and a pleasure for us to serve in this capacity. We've been down here on many, many occasions. President Samuelson, we've always left with the same impression. This is an absolutely wonderful place, and it's uh, always been a pleasure to be here. I am, uh, again, honored to introduce uh, our principal speaker this evening and those that will respond. Um, Justice Michael J. Wilkins retired from the Utah Supreme Court in 2010 after 16 years as an appellate judge. During that time, Wilkins participated in thousands of appellate cases. As a justice of the state, state's court of last resort, he has experience in cases of all descriptions, including the full variety of civil disputes tax challenges, water law cases, probate contests, construction matters, and complex litigation. Prior to his judicial appointment, he was engaged in a private civil practice in Salt Lake City. His private practice experience included a number of cases tried to verdict and judgment. He received a JD from the S.J. Quinney School of Law at the University of Utah and was admitted to the Utah Bar in 1977. While at the law school, he was on the editorial board of the Journal of Contemporary Law, chair of the Law Forum, and clerk for the Honorable F. Henry Henroyd of the Utah Supreme Court. In his career, he has appeared before state and federal courts in Utah, Nevada, California, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arizona. He also has an LM, LM, LLM degree from the University of Virginia Law School, and I believe your thesis was on the Utah Constitution and the State Board of Education, or close to it, and he was also chair of the Legislative Ethics Commission. This is just a little personal aside, but I did want to acknowledge Diane, who served so uh, with such distinction uh, as a juvenile court judge in Davis County. It's nice to see you. Um, this is just a little personal aside. I first met Mike Wilkins in a Sunday school class he was the teacher, and I turned to my wife and I said, this is a really smart guy. And I've known him for a long time since. Our children have gone to school together, and my opinion has not changed since. Stuart uh, Reed is a real estate and economic developer. He will be our uh, second respondent. He's currently serving as a senator in Senate District 18 in the Utah State Senate. He has served as Community and Economic De Development Director in both Salt Lake City and Ogden City and is currently on several boards, including the Ogden Development Foundation. He received BS and ME, degree, ME D degrees from Brigham Young University. Uh, Brenton Burbage, who will be our first respondent, is a 1975 graduate of the University of Utah College of Law. He's been an Assistant Attorney General. He served as Assistant to the President and as general counsel at Utah State University with an adjunct faculty appointment. He was also general counsel at Weber State University and associate general counsel at the University of Utah, as well as serving on the United States Department of Education Appeals Board during the Reagan administration. He is the former president of Curtin and McConkie and a founding partner of Burbage and White. He is general counsel for the Utah School Boards Association and serves as counsel for numerous school districts throughout Utah. Our uh, final respondent will be Deborah Roberts. She has served for the past eight years on the Utah State Board of Education and is currently the chair of the Utah State Board of Education. In 2008, she was named a Utah Rural School Friend of Education. She and her husband are part owners of a dairy alfalfa operation, and Deborah has been active in the Utah Farm Bureau having served on the State Women's Committee and as the County Women's Committee President. She has attended Brigham Young University as a National Merit Scholar, graduating with a BA in English. And I will say again, we English majors just have to stick together. <laughs> she and her husband have six children. Delighted to uh, introduce these individuals. And again, I'm going to just announce the order, if that's all right. We'll hear first 
from retired Justice Michael J. Wilkins, then from Brenton Burbage, then Stuart Reed, and then in conclusion, Deborah Roberts. I think we'll have some time at the end, and I'm expecting a lively uh, set of questions from the audience, so get ready. Thanks. Just let you know that uh, Dr. Kendall was not a very good student in the Sunday school class. <laughs> I, I jest, yes. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, actually, with homecoming weekend, kind of a surprise to see you all here. Surely must have had something better you could have been doing. Let's see if I can function. That, this is the, uh, the group photo of the Utah Constitutional Convention. You'll notice all of the women and children in the picture. <laughs> it would appear that mustaches may have been required for admission to the uh, organization. Where do I point this thing? Here? There we go. The topic I was asked to address was an apparent conflict in views between some educators and some members of the Utah legislature regarding who is primarily responsible for setting policy for Utah's public schools. Those of you who are in education have probably encountered this quotation. As I uh, started doing some research on the education side of the equation, I encountered this quotation repeatedly. Aristotle is widely quoted as having said, all who have meditated on the art of governing mankind have been convinced that the fate of empires depends on the education of youth. In its most altruistic form, Aristotle's sentiment may be understood to mean an educated public is essential for wise and effective government. In a more cynical interpretation, Aristotle may be interpreted to mean that the careful indoctrination of our children through early education can set the stage for lifelong attitudes that are reflected in the governments they are willing to support. Since statehood in 1896, tensions have developed between the Utah Legislature and the State Board of Education, these tensions in recent years have involved issues common to public schools in all states. Questions of funding for public schools, legislative directives relating to subjects to be taught or not taught, efforts by educators to actively participate in legislative decision making by both legislative membership and by lobbying. Anecdotal information attributing anti-Mormon motives to the education requirements of the Utah Enabling Act led some educators to adopt the view that Congress specifically intended the Utah public schools to be virtually free of state legislative influence. Conversely, legislators have acted generally with the attitude that the state legislature is the controlling policymaking body in the state in all areas, including public education. These somewhat conflicting views present an interesting and occasionally frustrating tension between the two constitutionally established bodies, the Utah Legislature and the State Board of Education. The purpose of this presentation is to explore the legal and traditional sources of authority employed to control the course of public education in Utah. In the process, it's necessary to compare the roles occupied by the Legislature and by the State Board. The dispute, such as it is, and it's not fisticuffs, at least very often. The origin of the dispute begins with the struggle for Utah statehood. We'll talk about that a bit. It focuses through the Utah Enabling Act, which we'll discuss as well, and then is brought to general fruition in the language of the 1895 Constitution. The Constitution includes an irrevocable provision, something that uh, is unusual in state constitutions. The 50 states that compose the United States of America each have a state constitution. It describes the distribution and limitations of authority granted them by the citizens. Unlike the federal constitution, which is one of delegated powers from the states and people to the federal government, state constitutions are constitutions of retained powers and contain all power vested in states with only those exceptions granted to the federal government. 
as required by the United States Constitution, each state constitution represents a Republican form of government, which necessarily includes a state level legislative body that is popularly elected and change, ch is charged with policy making duties for the state. However, each state's inclusion in the union is a unique story. Each state's history is marked by differences that result in formation of what is now that state. And Utah's journey towards statehood is perhaps even more unique, if that's possible, than others in some rather important ways. For example, the citizens of Utah Territory made repeated attempts to secure statehood only to be repeatedly rebuffed by Congress. These efforts extended for decades and only reached the desired result after submission of seven different drafts of proposed state constitutions. Much of the difficulty can be accurately attributed to the way in which Congress viewed the reputation and beliefs of the members and leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, often referred to as the Mormon Church. However, some significant delay and difficulty in approving Utah's petition for statehood may also be rightly attributed to the National Civil War and its aftermath, which occupied much of the mid-19th century. Quite literally, Congress had a lot on its plate. Admission of new states to the Federal Union was impacted significantly by the unresolved questions of slavery prior to the Civil War and by the difficult process of national rebuilding and reconciliation following the war. It was a time in America when regional differences, religious and racial identifications, and gender were common sources of official bias. As a consequence, admission to statehood was a process complicated by all of these factors, and Utah raised them all. The process of admission to the Union of States required the tacit or the formal approval of Congress. The formal approval process often included a specific act of Congress enabling the creation of a state. However, not all states entered the Union through the mechanism of a Congressional Enabling Act as Utah did. For example, the original 13 colonies became states upon adoption of the United States Constitution. Others, like the last two, Alaska and Hawaii, became states when Congress recognized an existing territorial government and a proffered state constitution as sufficient. Still others came into the state, came into the Union as states as a group through a single congressional approval. Only 23 of the 50 states entered the Union under the auspices of an enabling act at all. An enabling act authorized the admission of a new state by compliance with conditions set forth in the act, commonly. Conditions were included that required adoption of a state constitution acceptable to a majority of citizens, provisions for transition to the state government, recognition of the rights of the federal government, other ordinary provisions, requirement of a constitutional provision for a system of free public schools was always included. The public schools were always required to be free from sectarian control. However, only four states were required to include provisions specifically prohibiting plural marriage. The four states whose admission to the Union was conditioned on prohibition of plural marriage were Utah in 1896, Oklahoma in 1907, Arizona and New Mexico in 1912. While the predominance of Mormon settlers in the southern part of Idaho admitted in 1890 would seem to predict a similar prohibition in the Idaho process, the need for such specificity by Congress was preempted by a strongly anti-Mormon state constitution submitted for congressional approval. The Utah Enabling Act was adopted by the 53rd Congress signed into law by the President of the United States in July of 1894. It required any proposed Utah Constitution to specifically include a grant to all persons of equal civil and political rights, return of all unappropriated public lands to the United States, assumption of territorial debts by the new state, and provision for a system of public schools open to all and free from sectarian control. These specified <coughs> requirements were not unusual. However, the act also required the state constitution to include a provision providing that perfect toleration of religious sentiment shall be secured and that no inhabitant of said state shall ever be molested in person or property on account of his or her mode of religious worship, provided that polygamy and plural marriages are forever prohibited. These same provisions later to be required of Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma, including the specific prohibition on polygamy, as well as the requirement for public schools free of sectarian control, 
are unusual. They are the only four states required as such. And Arizona, with a significant Latter-day Saint population, seems somewhat reasonable. Uh, New Mexico is an easy one to understand because Arizona and New Mexico applied for statehood together. And in fact, Congress wanted to make it one state, and they didn't want to be one state. Oklahoma, I still don't understand. The congressional insistence on perpetual prohibition of polygamy and plural marriage and the accompanying standard provision for public schools free from sectarian control is at the root of our inquiry. It is the interplay of these two provisions demanded by Congress as conditions of admission to statehood that underpin much of the present day debate regarding the respective roles of legislators and school board members in setting policy for Utah's public schools. This is the irrevocable ordinance that was required by the Enabling Act. First, perfect toleration of religious sentiment is guaranteed. No inhabitant of this state shall ever be molested in person or property unless you wish to have a plural marriage. Second was that the people disclaimed a variety of things, rights to federal lands, among other things. Third, all debts and liabilities were to be transferred from territorial ledgers to state ledgers. And then fourth, the legislature shall make laws for the establishment and maintenance of a system of public schools which shall be open to all children of the state and be free from sectarian control. So we need to talk about that first constitution actually accepted by Congress, the eighth draft submitted. The Constitution of Utah that was approved by voters and accepted by President Grover Cleveland as sufficient under the Enabling Act was not the first draft submitted by seekers of statehood. When statehood was declared in January of 1896, the president was relying on the eighth constitution drafted by the citizens of the Utah Territory in <coughs> pursuit of admission. Starting in 1849, less than two years after the pioneers arrived in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake, and continuing with efforts in 1856, 1862, 1867, 1872, 1882, and 1887, the people of the Utah Territory had prepared and submitted seven prior drafts of proposed constitutions. These prior drafts, like the final accepted version of 1895, were composed of provisions drawn heavily from the constitutions of other states on the theory, apparently, that if they approved it for Iowa, perhaps they'll approve it for us. Earlier drafts relied on Illinois, Nevada, New York, among others, for guidance. The final and successful version drew heavily on the recently accepted Constitution of the State of Washington. In fact, provisions from successfully submitted constitutions were greatly favored by the Constitutional Convention of 1895. It was during the years of fruitless submissions from the 1840s to the 1880s that specific animosity toward the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints heavily influenced the actions of Congress. The Latter-day Saints had been driven from, their from the territorial bounds of the United States of America by illegal acts perpetrated by individual citizens, mobs, and officers of government at all levels. Property was taken by force of arms. Citizens were robbed, beaten, driven from place to place, and denied lawful redress from courts, legislators, and executives. Treatment of the Mormons in Missouri was particularly harsh. Governor Lilburn Boggs of Missouri went so far as to sign an executive order in 1838 authorizing the use of force to drive the Mormons from the state or failing that to exterminate them. The order remained in effect until revoked by Governor Christopher Bond of Missouri in July of 1976. Citizens of Illinois murdered church founder Joseph Smith Jr., among others, and drove the Mormons across the Mississippi River in winter, eventually leading the Mormons to settle in present-day Utah, which was not then part of the United States. Latter-day Saint leaders sought protection under the United States Constitution from courts and government in Missouri and Illinois, as well as elsewhere in the United States. The legal protection and relief they sought was generally not provided. They went so far as to visit the President of the United States in Washington, D.C., seeking help. Famously, upon presenting the facts of these deprivations of rights to President Martin Van Buren, church leaders were told, gentlemen, your cause is just but I can do nothing for you. If I take up for you, I shall lose Missouri. At the time of their expulsion from the United States, most 
Latter-day Saints consider themselves citizens of the United States. Upon arrival in the Valley of the Great Salt Lake, once shelter and food had been arranged and provision made for those still traveling from the United States to join them, Mormons began the quest for political reunion with the United States. The first petition for admission to the Union was made in 1849. However, the same religious practices that had caused unrest in Missouri and Illinois toward Mormons remain. Mormons presented a cohesive voting bloc, a relatively closed society, and embraced plural marriage. With the U.S. Civil War only a decade off, the timing for statehood for such a society was not good. Utah statehood was caught up as part of the national debate of the day. The country was torn over the moral and legal propriety of enslaving kidnapped Africans. The moral outrage of some members of Congress found easy connection between slavery and plural marriage. This myth was perpetrated by the general ignorance of Mormon theology combined with the popular perception that Mormon women were being forced into these polygamous arrangements against their will. And with the Mormons far away in the West and without meaningful defenders in the halls of power, the connection was an easy one to capitalize on politically. In fact, the national platform of the Republican Party, adopted in 1856, denounced the twin relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. It was the first national election for the Republican Party. Uh, they lost. Their candidate was John C. Fremont. Their next one, a congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln, was somewhat more successful. By the time Lincoln took office in 1861, the new nation conceived in liberty, as he later referred to it, was already fully engulfed in an internal battle for moral direction. It took years for the country to come to terms with slavery, notwithstanding the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Lincoln freeing slaves in the Confederate States in 1863, the outcome of the Civil War in 1865 destroying the Confederate States as a political body, and the adoption of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution in 1865, 1867, and 1870 that effectively outlawed slavery the cause of obtaining full rights of citizenship for black Americans continued well into the second half of the 20th century. Linked as it was in the minds of many to slavery, polygamy continued to carry dark and sinister moral overtones even after the resolution of the slavery question in the late 1800s. The fact that Mormon plural wives were not rising up in revolt and in fact enjoyed more rights than women within the rest of the United States, such as the right to vote, did nothing to modify or soften those political views. The difficulty in achieving statehood for Utah had little to do with the first seven submitted draft constitutions. The language of the proposed constitutions was unimportant to Congress. Mormon theology was the problem, and not until the leaders of the church officially and publicly suspended plural marriage and pledged complete submission to the laws of the United States did Congress seriously consider the request for statehood. The language of the drafts that had been submitted was unobjectionable by 19th century standards. Ultimately, once plural marriage was banned, only the vote for women was contrary to the congressional will, and the vote for women was easily abandoned in favor of statehood. The ordinance, the irrevocable ordinance, appears in the Constitution of Utah, adopted by the voters in 1895, effective in 1896 when it became a state. My reference is to the 1895 Constitution. If you look in any law book, it'll say 1896 because that's when Utah became a state. But it was adopted in 1895. The language here is the language that we've begun discussing and that seems to make a difference. I pause to note that the United States Constitution requires all states to be admitted on equal footing. <coughs> and yet, four states have provisions which require the consent of the United States to change their state constitutions. My guess is that's unconstitutional. <laughs> I'm also quite certain no one has challenged it yet. In that Constitution, after presentation of the irrevocable ordinance, Article 10 presents the language on education, and it simply recites again the language of the irrevocable ordinance. The legislature shall prepare. This is a new section, a section that was in the Constitution but not in the irrevocable ordinance. 
the general control and supervision of the public school system shall be vested in the State Board of Education, consisting of the superintendent of public instruction and such other persons as the legislature may provide. It is this language which has created some conflict in interpretation. What powers did Congress intend the state legislature to have with respect to setting policy for public schools? As I've said before, some in the education community, particularly some members of the State Board of Education, its highest governing body, have expressed the view that Congress intended to minimize legislative influence in educational policy. On the other hand, some legislators have held the view that the legislature is designed policy is designated is the designated policy-making body for statewide policy and that the board is subordinate to that authority. An examination of these conflicting claims is a useful starting point to our legal analysis under the present Utah Constitution's provisions. The simple argument for supremacy of the board in matters of education policy goes like this. At the time of statehood, Congress demonstrated a concern that the Mormon Church, through its population and political dominance, might attempt to exercise excessive influence on the public schools. This concern was evidenced by inclusion of the requirement in the Enabling Act of the irrevocable ordinance that both prohibited plural marriages and required public schools to be free of sectarian control. Absent the inclusion of both provisions, the argument goes, Utah would not have been admitted to statehood. Since it's logical to presume the political dominance of Mormons would be reflected in a Mormon dominance in the state legislature and other political offices, the language free of sectarian control obviously must have been intended to sweep within its prohibition controlled by the Mormon-controlled state legislature. <coughs> Furthermore, advocates of this view contend that the 1895 Constitution that was adopted by the citizens and accepted by the United States as conforming to the Enabling Act also contains a provision that clearly vests the general control and supervision of the public school system in the State Board of Education. The legislature, therefore, would have no authority under the Constitution to meddle in the control and supervision of the public schools. The argument for legislative supremacy is simpler to state. The legislature is the body empowered by the Utah Constitution with the duty and authority to set state policy. The State Board of Education is an executive department agency subject to legislative policy just like every other agency in the state. <coughs> the Utah Supreme Court has adopted a number of guidelines for its interpretation of the state constitution. As the final arbiter of meaning of the state constitution, the high court has expressed an intent to provide a uniform methodology for interpretive efforts, believing that doing so provides the most consistent and policy-free resolution of such questions. Perhaps the most consistently applied starting point for constitutional language is the plain language evaluation. If the language under evaluation is susceptible to only a single understanding, that interpretation is applied. Only if the language presents multiple interpretations on its face does the court refer to other evidence of the meaning of the provision. The, the other evidence may be a reference to other provisions in the same document, known as reading the provisions in harmony or even resorting to the history of the drafting of the language in an attempt to ascertain the meaning intended by the drafters. Only when these attempts still leave multiple and incompatible meanings does the court allow itself to view the subject as a matter of policy. Theoretically, when faced with an otherwise insolvable conflict in possible interpretations of the same provision, the court attempts to apply the most conservative, small c, most conservative and narrow interpretation that will answer the question, leaving the legislative process for revision, correction, clarification of the question language. Today's Constitution still contains the irrevocable ordinance, unchanged. Article 10 is still the education article. In 1896, when it was adopted, the legislature shall provide for the establishment and maintenance of a uniform system of public schools free from sectarian control. It now reads, the legislature shall provide for the establishment and maintenance of a system of public education and higher education. Both systems shall be free from sectarian control. The Constitution in 1896 provided the general control and supervision of the public school system shall be vested in a state board of education. 
it now provides the general control and supervision of the public education system shall be vested in the State Board of Education. Note also, however, that in the original language it says, consisting of the superintendent and such other persons as the legislature may provide. In the current provision it says, the membership of the board shall be established and elected as provided by statute. In our system, the only outfit that can create statutes is the legislature. Then the state board appoints the state superintendent. Nothing in the language of section three, which is the one on, on the side closest to me here, the current section three, which is the only constitutional mention of the state board of education, suggests that the board is isolated from the other elements of state government. However, the vesting of general control and supervision of the public schools in the board does offer clear support for the proposition that the public schools are under the exclusive control and supervision of the board. I ask you, can section three be read to exclude the schools from legislative control? I believe it can. But can section three be read to leave the board within the policy control of the legislature? I believe it can. Do these two reasonable interpretations of the language present conflicting results? Again, I believe so. Consequently, under the interpretive methodology used by the state's highest court, we must look beyond the plain language of this isolated section to find the answer we seek. We expand our view to surrounding sections dealing with the same topic in an effort to discern what the section creating the board is intended to mean. Our expanded examination looks at the entire education article, Article 10. Since the only direct reference to the State Board of Education is in Section 3, the remaining sections of Article 10 must be examined for indications of the authority of the board or of the legislature. Looking at the references to legislative authority in education, we find a number of references. I'm not going to put you to sleep by trying to track them. I'll just give you a, a glimpse of them here. Uh, Article 1, the legislature shall provide for the establishment of a system of public education. Uh, Article 2, the education system shall include public and elementary schools as the legislature may designate and public and uh, public universities and colleges and such other institutions as the legislature may designate. Article 3, membership of the board shall be established and elected as provided by statute. Article 4, section 4 rather, the general control and supervision of higher education shall be for as provided by statute. Uh, article section five is about funding and it goes on and on. Revenues appropriated by the legislature, legislature may make appropriations, revenues appropriated by the legislature, portioned by the legislature, legislature may provide. Section seven, the legislature by statute may provide for the use of uh, land grant lands and funds. Section eight and nine make passing reference, but it's not worth the trouble. So, in order to figure out, if I were sitting with the Supreme Court, we were faced with this as a question of law presented in a case. Clearly, this question, we couldn't duck it, which with constitutional questions, we always try to do. <laughs> if we couldn't find a way around it without interpreting the Constitution, the language of Article 10 of the Constitution that addresses education tells us not a lot about where to separate the State Board of Education from the legislative power. It tells us a lot about legislative power. There are some specifics and some generals. State Board has language about control and supervision. So we need to look at uh, legislative power. And if I can remember where I was, there we go. Article 5 of the state constitution contains this provision today. It contained it at the time of statehood. It's a separation of powers provision. The powers of the government of the state of Utah shall be divided into three distinct departments, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, and a person in one may not trespass in the duties of another. It doesn't always happen this way, but that's what it says. The legislature, under the interpretation of, or under the, uh, the language of today's constitution, the legislative power of the state shall be vested in, Senate and House designated the legislature, and the people, as provided in 
a section describing initiative and referendum petitions. The ability of people in the state of Utah to legislate directly is limited, but the power of the legislative department of government is the legislature and the people in those instances. This was the original provision. Legislative power vested in the legislature. So we have a, a provision in the Constitution that creates as a constitutional mandate a State Board of Education, granting to it control and supervision, vests in it control and supervision of the public schools. The only reference in the Constitution. In the Constitution, we have a variety of references to the legislature and to the legislative department of government. Considering the plain language of the Constitution relating to public schools and the board, there's no compelling definition of a division of responsibility between the legislature and the board with respect to setting overall policy for the schools. <coughs> Both have a constitutionally mandated role to play. Both have sufficiently general roles that policy decisions are clearly includable within those roles. Considering, however, the broader context of the Constitution, the legislature, and to a lesser extent the people directly, are clearly intended to be the primary source of policy for the state as a whole. It's the legislature that must resolve competing demands for resources, acceptance or rejection of federal educational mandates, appropriations of state-controlled funds, and the like, with the express power to determine the composition, terms, and election methods of the board's members. The legislature is clearly in a superior position of power. It's equally true that the people have vested at least the general day-to-day -day management of public education in the board, not the legislature. The language of the present Constitution is consistent with that of the 1895 Constitution approved for statehood with regard to educational policy making. The legislature is empowered to make policy for the state in all areas, including public education. The state board is an executive agency subordinate to the legislature in, uh, subordinate to the legislature in setting broad policy and subject to the legislature's power to modify and revise at its pleasure the structure of the board and its functions within the broad mandate of the Constitution. The board is more akin to an executive officer of the public school system than that of the board of directors, in my view. As executive officers, the board must make policy decisions relating to the operation of the system of public schools. But those decisions are clearly subject to the legislative power to withhold resources or give specific statutory direction for the exercise of those general powers of supervision and control. The legislative mandate on drugs, on guns, on fire control, on earthquake safety are no more intrusive on the general powers of the board than our legislative mandates for general topics to be taught and limitations on teacher behavior, not legally so. So I reached these conclusions. The Utah Enabling Act and its language and its history, frankly, were superseded by enactment of the state constitution. The constitution empowered the legislature to establish the public schools and set limits to the authority of the State Board of Education. In my former day job before I retired, in trying to determine how a, legis uh, how a, a mandate, statutory mandate, might be interpreted, it was common practice to think in terms of, well, what's the worst thing that they could do? If under the Constitution, the legislature has the ability to set the identity, the terms, the conditions of selection, election of members of the state board, what's to stop them from saying, okay, we're going to have one member and it's going to be the person elected governor. Legally, there's nothing to stop them that I can see. It may be terrible policy. It may get the, uh, the legislature all turned out at the next election, but, but as a legal matter, that's very doable. So the legislature clearly has the upper hand in that sense. The modern constitution leaves unchanged the scope of that legislative authority. There's no meaningful legal authority for reading the anti-polygamy provision and the sectarian controlled educational provision as constituting a mandate for any diminishment of legislative authority. I could find nothing in the constitutional convention record or in the congressional record, suggesting that that was part of this debate. 
it was certainly on the mind of many members of Congress earlier in, the, uh, in that century. The authority to act does not always equate with good policy. So, I then begin with these premises to make some recommendations. First, I consider all members of the state school board, past and present, to be honorable people dedicated to public service whose only interest and aim is to provide the best possible education for the children of Utah. Second, I consider all members of the legislature, past and present, to be honorable people dedicated to public service whose only interest and aim is to provide the best possible circumstances for the people of Utah, children included, to prosper. Third, the Utah Constitution gives both the legislature and the State Board of Education a permanent role in making and implementing public policy as it directly relates to the public school system. And fourth, the Utah Constitution contains no binding language that gives the State Board of Education authority that is independent of legislative oversight and direction. And finally, the people of Utah, especially the children of Utah, are best served when precious resources are devoted, excuse me, to education of children rather than disputes about who controls those resources. So, again, I'd like to take just a moment and talk about cooperative policy making. It seems to me that if this is a real dispute still among members of the education community and legislators, that there is a, uh, a very worthwhile effort to be made in agreeing on how to divide up the policy responsibility. There's very little value in fighting over that, but there's a lot of value in trying to work out an agreement. These are all smart people, and they all want essentially the same thing. They just want to go about it in a slightly different way. Secondly, you might consider adding an early warning mechanism. The judiciary under the Utah, well, the Utah Supreme Court under the state constitution has the authority to make rules for the functioning of the courts. The legislature under the state constitution has the authority to change those rules by a two-thirds vote, I think it is, I'm sorry, I don't remember, if they feel that the rule is, is not a good rule. Not too long in the past, forgive me, Madam Speaker, not too long in the past, the legislature changed one of our rules, but we had no idea why. And when I uh, chatted with both the House and the Senate sponsors and asked them, they didn't know either. They could tell me the lobbyists that encouraged them to do it and that there must be a good reason for it, but they really couldn't designate it for me. So we allowed the legislature uh, to exercise its constitutional power and to change that rule, and they did. And then the day after the session ended, we sat down and exercised our constitutional power and changed it back. This did not please some members of the legislature. And it made some members of the Supreme Court, of which there were only five, very nervous and for good cause. The legislature now has a committee which considers judicial rules. And they have incorporated practice of alerting us to when they think one of our rules needs adjustment which allows us to discuss it between the two departments of government and avoid a public challenge as to which way it goes. I'm not sure how much interaction the education community and the legislature have other than in the press. I presume that there's a great deal. But a mechanism where every time something appears on your agenda that you expect the others to be offended by as a matter of courtesy and honor, you inform them that it's coming and invite their input in advance of action in both directions. Might be a useful tool. The third thing you can do is change the language <coughs> of the Constitution. One of the biggest problems we always had in, the, in, in my <coughs> former day job was we would receive a legislative uh, mandate to interpret, and it would not necessarily say what we thought they meant. And my view always was, if I could understand the language and it could be implemented, I would vote to treat it as it was. And if it was not what they wanted, it was up to them to change it. In writing contracts for uh, uh, clients in ancient times, 
The trick is to write a contract that everybody understands to be what it is. There's no value in clever language. There's no value in obtuse language. So if the constitutional language about who controls public policy for the schools is a challenge to functioning, it may well be time to clarify that in a way that satisfies everyone involved. With due deference to Senator Reid, whose uh, proposal I have not read, it may be that a gentle approach is the best way. With due deference to the State Board of Education, whose job I've never had to do, it may be that recognition of that legislative prerogative will save you some time. But it seems to me that there are ways to adjust that language. Utah's Constitution is not as hard to change. Uh, contrary to public opinion, it is, or, or misconception, it was not divinely inspired. It was uh, created as a sort of the last great compromise of desperation. These then are my conclusions in simple form. The legislature has the authority to set statewide policy for the public schools, period. The State Board of Education is subordinate to that legislative authority if the legislature wishes to exercise it. And that the question is not who has the authority to act, but who ought to. What makes the most sense? My uh, deep and fervent hope that uh, those who are in those positions of responsibility and those who follow them will find an effort to conciliatory cooperative action less troubling, <coughs> less difficult, and less time and resource consuming than the occasional uh, out and out battle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am a, uh, an unapologetic proponent of public education. I believe that public education is the great societal ladder to opportunity and to the benefits and blessings of the democracy that we enjoy. This democracy is not very efficient. Um, there's a lot of debate that goes on. There are a lot of discussions that are held. There's a lot of uh, comment that has to be made, both public and private. And that is all part of the democratic process. And I think we're in a part of that process tonight in which we discuss points of view, interpretations, and we should all welcome this and encourage it among our colleagues and others. As we consider the role of public education constitutionally uh, in terms of governance and as it's constitutionally set forth in the state of Utah, I'd like to refer, if I could, to uh, a, uh, a decision of the Utah Supreme Court in 1952. This is a decision by uh, uh, Justice, Chief Justice Wolf, and it was at a time when there was a change in the Utah Constitution. Prior to this time, the state superintendent of public instruction was an elected official, like the treasurer, like the auditor, like the attorney general. Statewide election. And it was determined that wasn't a wise approach, and that that elected position was eliminated and the state superintendent became the appointed executive officer of the State Board of Education. And the reason I read this is to underscore the importance of the executive position and function of the State Board of Education. For those of you that are paying attention, <coughs> this is the decision of uh, State Board of Education versus Commissioner of Finance. 122 Utah, 164, 247 Pacific 2nd, 435, again a 1952 decision. And here's Justice Wolf and his comments. 
prior to no November 5, 1950, and I'm reading from page four, the management of the public school system in this state, and I think that's important, the management of the public school system in this state was vested in an elective state superintendent of public instruction and the appointive state board of education as will be seen by the following former provisions of our state constitution and then he cites article 10 section 8 as has been presented by uh, Justice Wilkins. The language of the gen and I'm not reading now from the uh, decision but the language general supervision and control is unique to that executive office and it is unique in the context of governance and the context of control. Um, this particular fight was between the state auditor, who, or, or rather the, uh, the state commissioner of finance who didn't want to pay this appointive uh, state superintendent. But I think we need to begin in the context of the three branches of government and the checks and balances that are built in to check the power of the executive branch. That is, the state uh, superintendent of public instruction, the board of education, that state board, does not have the power to raise revenue. But it does have the executive power over public education. And specifically the general supervision and control of public education. The legislature traditionally and in this particular setting has the power of the purse as it should have. We have to have checks and balances. We cannot function as a state, as a society, as a democracy without those checks and balances. And I, for one, welcome them and encourage action within the purview, within the scope of those checks and balances. And when there's a disagreement on the exercise of power, then this democracy that we have has the decider, the judiciary, who then makes the decision as to whose power is what. I, as uh, Justice Wilkins, uh, I am in agreement with Justice Wilkins that this power issue, if it is one, is not one that is that where the, the best interests of the populace and especially kids in education is served by confrontation. I think the most important thing is, is for the entities involved, including the public, to recognize the benefits and the opportunities that come through the appropriate exercise of power and authority and the recognition of power and authority. Just like it would be folly to vest in, a, in an educational board like the State Board of Education the power to tax and to raise revenue and to expend revenue in effect a blank check uh, it would also, I think, be inappropriate in the face of the constitutional language that we have in the state of Utah to suggest that the legislature has all power and all control over the educational institutions and the educational organs within the state of Utah. I think there are public policy reasons for this too. Uh, in addition to the checks and balances that I've noted, which are beneficial to the public as each of these entities exercises their constitutional and their governmental roles. I think there are reasons for the various uh, uh, separation of powers, if you will. First of all, uh, I think it's important that a State Board of Education represent the total public and be nonpartisan, which we would lose if education were strictly and completely controlled by the legislature. I think another thing that's important is the continuity that one has 
in the State Board of Education, which you may lose in the context of the uh, legislature. You have board members who are dedicated and focused on public education in Utah. There are so many uh, calls for the time of legislators. I, I really sympathize with what you're going through right now in the context of the process that is important and necessary and so time consuming. A dedicated or, or a group dedicated to the education of the state of, of kids in the state of Utah, like the State Board of Education, is, is called for in this kind of a setting. The legislature is overburdened and overworked, and the State Board has that opportunity to focus on <coughs> those important issues in education. And in this same context of the public uh, need and the, and the public uh, uh, process <coughs> here, I think it's important to note that the State Board of Education is subject to the Open and Public Meetings Law. So as a public policy matter, every citizen of the state of Utah can attend all of the meetings of the State Board of Education except those limited areas where the legislature has indicated that we can close a meeting or that a meeting can be closed. That's not true with the legislature. I think you have a, a, a more public organ, a more public deliberation. And, and finally, in the context of what we're dealing with, I absolutely agree that confrontation is inappropriate. Dialogue is essential. Will the state board always agree with the legislature? I hope not. And I hope the legislature does not agree with the state board of education. That's the checks and balances that we're dealing with here. Uh, there's a phrase that I've used in, in my personal life, and that is, when everyone thinks alike, no one thinks very much. That's not my phrase. I read it on the wall somewhere. This dynamic, this tension, if you will, between the legislature and the State Board of Education is healthy if it is controlled. I, I, I agree with much of what Justice Wilkins has said in terms of the importance of both of these governmental entities and the importance of their getting along and working together and establishing lines of communication and ways of working together and, and uh, promoting good public education policy and practice in the state of Utah. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Wheatley Institution for this invitation and uh, was as important uh, the reprieve from the redistricting <coughs> committee. <coughs> it won't be long lived. The speaker and I have to report early in the morning to the committee to continue our work there. Um, that uh, if there's any ever any question about real politique it is manifested uh, through the redistricting process. And I'll speak to that a little bit in the relationship between the school board and the legislature. President Samuelson, I uh, appreciate uh, the invitation from BYU and the, work, the, uh, the institute. Um, President Samuelson and I met each other <coughs> when I was running for mayor of Salt Lake City against Rocky Anderson. That was a white knuckle experience for him. And I uh, hope that uh, this won't be one of those white knuckle experiences for you tonight. I was staff uh, for some time in uh, for the public affairs uh, committee of the LDS Church, which he later served on his capacity as the area president. And so he was hoping and probably praying that I wouldn't do anything in that campaign that would embarrass the church. Um, Justice Wilkins, let me first say how enlightening both your legal and historical analysis, the powers of the constitutionality vest in the Board of Education and the legislature. Um, it almost made me regret changing my mind about uh, going into law 
as a young man, as did I went into the military as a chaplain. I say almost made me regret that. <clears throat> I appreciate your complimentary observations of those involved in public service, both as board members and legislators. Your compliments may be too liberal though. Um, I do appreciate the virtuous admonition for both the board and legislature to work together for the sake of the children and their education. There probably is nothing more important than that. <clears throat> but unfortunately, there is not an equal balance of power between the legislature and, and the school board and cannot be under our present system. It would be nice if we got along. It would be very nice if we got along. <clears throat> but the founding fathers in creating the three powers of government understood that virtue among those who govern would be sporadic at best and that there would be uh, interest in dominating and so they in their wisdom created uh, the three branches of government. Unfortunately <clears throat> the school board with the superintendent is aberrated and because of the aberration they're disadvantaged. And I may surprise them when I say they're disadvantaged in a way that undermines the children and the education system. In my world, in the legislature, uh, the rubric that we live in is about realpolitik. It is a reality of managing power. And while <coughs> some may want to be virtuous and work, and, and frankly that does happen, uh, work with the school board over education systems, there are others who do not. In fact, view the school board as um, their adversaries in promoting policies that they think uh, would improve the education system the school board would never be able to accept in some cases. So what do you do with that? <clears throat> well, the reality is the legislature controls the purse. Those who control the purse control the policy. And frankly, uh, Justice, it, in the day-to-day -day, um, interaction between the legislature and the board, what the Constitution says has far less meaning than uh, the control of the purse. <clears throat> And so the school board's at a disadvantage. They will attempt from time to time to borrow authority from the governor. In other words, if they can persuade him to veto something that the legislature does, um, that can help them. <clears throat> they can encourage him to trade with the legislature in this world of realpolitik. The school board has nothing to trade because their mission is singular and it is focused where the governor would have uh, policy advantages, uh, policy resources that he can trade over a series of different interests uh, relating to governance. The school board does not have that. Again, they may be, be able to persuade the governor. However, the governor is slow, rightfully so, to involve himself in some of those disputes because he does not have authority. You noticed Justice Wilkins did not mention the governor in his speech tonight because he does not have constitutional authority to manage neither the purse nor the policies over education. And in fact, that's, in my view, one of the great disadvantages of our state, that there is no single person who is ultimately responsible and accountable and has authority over the three silos of education, public ed, higher ed, and now 
what's becoming more prominent, the ATCs. There's no one to, uh, in a sense, referee those three silos. <clears throat> Let me just give you a couple of quick examples. So public ed will complain about higher ed not preparing qualified teachers to deal with the challenges they're facing with the changing demographics and population of Ogden and the schools. Higher ed will complain to public ed <clears throat> that they're not properly preparing the students to enter university life or college life. So how does that get resolved? If you throw the ATC, they complain that the public ed is not allowing the kids in high school, the students in high school to, uh, to easily uh, transfer into the ATCs. And the ATCs will complain that higher ed views them as second class uh, in their mission and that they're disadvantaged as a result of that. <clears throat> so who resolves that? To date, nobody can resolve that. And so we don't have a seamless system that makes all of this works together, work together. So higher ed could say, well, okay, we'll be nice and we'll try to work harder at training the teachers that will help you prepare the students for university life. Public ed can say, well, we'll, we'll be nice too and we'll do a better job preparing the students to enter the university. But that's not happening. <clears throat> I think today the, the Board of Education thinks that uh, my proposal, which I'll share with you in a moment, that somehow I'm being adversarial to them. From my perspective, just the opposite. I'm trying to empower public ed in a way that they do have <clears throat> an equal footing, a balance of power with the legislature. Believing if that happens that there will be better legislation, if not detrimental legislation, will be passed in the legislature. This last session, there were 212 education bills drafted. 60 or so passed. We will become more involved in education, not less. We will get become more micromanaging, not less. And I do not believe that's should that that should be the the uh, policy of the legislature, because I believe it does disadvantage the school system. So I, my call is for the school board to understand that they're at risk in realpolitik in our present system. They are disadvantaged, therefore the students are disadvantaged. And my recommendation is, and I propose legislation that passed the Senate, uh, the Speaker and other leaders in the House asked me not to foist it upon the House, so I did not do that. <clears throat> so they had more time to deliberate about it. My legislation calls for a constitutional amendment giving the governor constitutional authority and responsibility over education under statute, which will formalize his authority, his responsibility um, for the education system. So when he stands up and says, I want to be the education governor because it's so critical to the prosperity of Utah and economic development, those words will have meaning. <clears throat> Does that mean the school board goes, and goes away? No, under my proposal, the school board will be appointed by the governor. Under my proposal, there would be a commissioner of education. There would be superintendents over the three silos of education. Each would have a board to advise those superintendents who would counsel with the commissioner 
uh, and the governor. <coughs> right now we have 104 legislators that are acting like a super school board. Uh, and that's not benefiting anyone. And it will continue the conflicts between the board and the legislative bodies. Moreover, we have a dominant party. As a Republican, I think that's a good thing. <clears throat> but it vests more power in the legislature, not less. Again, disadvantaging the school board. I would like more, as much as Justice Wilkins to believe that we can do this in a virtuous way. The founding fathers didn't believe that. <clears throat> and I think there's pl plenty of evidence in our state experience uh, to demonstrate that that does not happen when there's not a balance of power. And there clearly is not a balance of power between the school board and the legislature, ultimately because the, the legislature controls the purse. So as we discuss this further tonight and into the future, uh, I hope we would consider the importance of the three branches of government and the power that are invested in each one of those branches that the school board does not have and therefore is disadvantaged and therefore our children are disadvantaged. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. It is a pleasure to be back on the BYU campus. I can tell you there's nothing in the world like uh, walking out of the testing center knowing you haven't performed quite as well as you would have liked and hearing the bells toll all is well, all is well. <laughs> I would like to express my appreciation to Justice Wilkins for his thoughtful consideration of public education governance and to Mr. Burbridge and Senator Reed for their desire to elucidate their own positions. As I have pondered these different positions, I found myself asking some simple questions. Number one, do we believe in a strong and vibrant public education system equipped to meet the needs of our increasingly varied students in the state of Utah? Some might wonder at the need to ask that question, but in today's acerbic political environment, it is a question that must be pointedly and publicly asked. It is my belief based on the evidence of the choices made by Utah parents and by the only two recent voucher debate that the answer to that is yes. Unfortunately, that, that is an answer that we will have to continue to be pointed and public in repeating. Two, the next question then becomes, what is the best governance model within public education to serve the needs of those varied student populations, even more to see, serve the needs of the 576,245 individual students we serve today? I am not a scholar of law, of politics, or of governments. I am a student of practicality and common sense. When the governance question is linked to the question of who represents the public in public education, my answer would say that elected district boards of education and locally elected state board of education. This speaks directly to the assertion that education would be better served by some kind of education czar appointed by the governor to oversee higher ed, the UCAT system, and public education. I believe that Senator Reid bases his policy on several mistaken assertions. The first assertion is that our education system is broken or failing. I offer a couple of things that speak to our success. First, this year the United States Chamber of Commerce rated us as the best return on educational investment. In other words, we are the most efficient and effective educational system in the nation. We do more with less than anybody else. Next, some of the important measurements of what we do are those measurements that look at college and career readiness. On the SAT, ACT combined scale scores, Utah ranks 12th in the nation. To give you a true sense of how we do so well on so little, Minnesota ranked first on the SAT, ACT scores, and Minnesota's per pupil spending is $10,396. Massachusetts ranked 10th, and they spend $12,599 per student. Ranked at 12th, Utah spends 63% of what Minnesota spends and 52% of what Massachusetts spends, approximately $6,525 per student. 
I will be the first to acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do to evolve our system into being the kind of system that our children need now and in the future. But looking at these numbers, it is easy to see why we are considered the best educational value in the nation. We are in many ways a success, especially considering the extremely low investment the state has chosen to make in this endeavor. Senator Reid's next assertion is that the governor-led education system would be more efficient and thus more effective. I believe my previous citations answer that, but let me add a couple of thoughts. The senator's proposal would set up an education czar appointed by the governor to oversee higher ed, UCAT, and public ed. Two glaring concerns. Public education is a completely different entity than higher ed in both its purpose and the resources needed to fulfill that purpose. We are open to every single child, 5 to 18, as an opportunity to receive an education. We are dealing with the most vulnerable and the most important assets in this state and in our nation. In delivering our promises to these future generations, we have no significant income resources outside of the public coffers. The second concern closely related to the first is that such a czar would most effectively and immediately remove an important layer of public input, response, and local accountability to our public education system. By eliminating a state board of education elected in local election booths by the citizens of this great state, it would in fact create a bureaucratic layer rather than a group of elected citizens who can respond to the public, to the parents, to the grandparents, to the community members of the state when it comes to educational policy. As an elected member of the Utah State Board of Education, I am immediately accessible to the public and I rely on their higher and fire power exercised in the voting booth every four years. I answer directly to them and to their needs and their desires for their children and for their grandchildren. Let me also state that seemingly unknown to Senator Reid, higher ed and public ed have one of the closest working relationships of any public and higher ed leaders in the nation. Other states are amazed at how we have worked together within our K through 16 alliance to create effective concurrent enrollment, focused teacher preparation programs, a unique student identifier that allows us to follow students into higher ed, a website to inform parents and students about educational opportunities, and many, many other projects. The next argument is that education is a many-headed hydra with no single entity in charge, that we are somehow not as effective or as efficient as we could be if one person were in charge. The only way to completely diminish that many-headed hydra theory would be to eliminate the 41 elected local boards of education. One of the long-standing mantras of a public education system is that local community interests and concerns should be reflected in our neighborhood schools to diminish in any way local boards would be to lose that community control of what happens in schools and again the loss of the public voice at the local level. I uh, am known for being pretty plain spoken but even so I will state that I do not mean to offend with my next statement. This statement reflects my frustration with too many initiatives through the years that have proved a distraction to the work we are trying to accomplish in making our system become what it needs to be to serve individual students. I would respectfully request that the good senator cease to try to find some magic bullet that will solve all of our educational challenges. I promise you that no such silver bullet exists. Please step away from the red herring of governance and allow the board to get on with the important work we are trying to accomplish through our promises to keep. It is hard and complicated work. We need to work together, not against each other. With that, let me somewhat ironically now talk about the relationship between the State Board of Education and the Utah State Legislature. I do appreciate Justice Wilkins' suggestions and find merit in many of them. Let me help you understand what the board has attempted to do in order to build a healthy constitutional partnership with the legislature. We began approximately seven years ago to hold legislative meetings where we discussed and took stands on proposed legislation. Legislators were also invited to come and speak with the board on numerous occasions. That has now evolved to the point where we try to, to only take positions on those bills where we have heard and understand the individual legislators' desires in relation to their bills. In addition, we have opened our doors to work closely with legislators as they create their legislation. Three years ago, we appointed, we appointed a board member who is a former legislator to be our legislative liaison, a direct and constant link to our board, from our board to the legislature. Two years ago, we proposed legislation and asked legislators to actually sponsor that legislation. 
This year, we have created a list of legislative proposals that we are finding sponsors for, and we will be working cooperatively with the legislature to see the ideas in those propo proposals come to fruition. In addition, we have completely revamped our budget proposal philosophy. We used to send a budget that came to be viewed as an impossible wish list. We now try to look at the monies that will be available and then create a realistic budget within those monies. We have been criticized by some education stakeholders that we are not appropriately representing the true needs of education with this more practical budget procedure. But we have chosen to do so, recognizing the tough choices made by so many sincere and hardworking legislators. For the past two years, guiding all of the work of the State Board of Education in terms of reaction to legislative proposals, our own legislative policy suggestions, and our internal policy decisions has been our overriding vision and mission statement entitled Promises to Keep. To a certain extent, a level of tension, a kind of checks and balances between governmental entities is a healthy thing. If we were constantly linking arms singing Kumbaya, we would probably not be having the kind of healthy give and take that ought to be in place. However, if the legislature were by joint resolution to adopt the educational vision found in the fundamental prim principles of the Promises to Keep document, our partnership could become more effective and more efficient. It is not a single governing entity that is needed, but a vision, giving guidance as to where we need to go and what we need to accomplish. In summary, my main points. One, if we believe in the public of public education, which I believe we do, then that public is best represented by the governing system currently in place. Elected boards, local boards of education, guided by state policy from a locally elected state board of education, working in constitutional partnership with the state legislature. Two, changing the constitution to put education governance directly into the hands of the governor would not serve our state, our communities, our students, because it would create a bureaucratic layer that would hurt state representative responsiveness to parents and to local education concerns. Three, the state board of education has worked hard to develop a more effective working partnership with the legislature, and we would welcome further work in this area as initiated by the legislature. Four, a more effective and efficient approach for education policy would be for the legislature to recognize and strive to work within the foundational education principles of promises to keep. In the end, we truly do have miles to go before we sleep and promises which we need to keep to our children. And those promises are best kept by working together for the good of our students in the public education system. I thank you.